from the macabre minds of Laughing Devil Production comes another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind, amp up your imagination, and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. His Unconquerable Enemy by W. C. Morrow I was summoned from Calcutta to the heart of India to perform a difficult surgical operation on one of the women of a great Raja's household. I found the Raja a man of noble character, a possessed, as I afterward discovered, of a sense of cruelty purely oriental and in contrast to the indolence of his disposition. He was so grateful for the success that attended my mission that he urged me to remain a guest at the palace as long as it might please me to stay, and I thankfully accepted the invitation. One of the male servants attracted my notice for his marvelous capacity of malice. His name was Naranya, and I am certain that there must have been a large proportion of Malay blood in his veins. For unlike the Indians, from whom he differed also in complexion, he was extremely alert, active, nervous, and sensitive. A redeeming circumstance was his love for his master. Once his violent temper led him to the commission of an atrocious crime, the fatal stabbing of a dwarf. In punishment for this, the Raja ordered that Naranya's right arm the offending one be severed from his body. That sentence was executed in a bungling fashion by a stupid fellow armed with an axe, and I, being a surgeon, was compelled in order to save Naranya's life to perform an amputation of the stump, leaving not a vestige of the limb remaining. After this, he developed an augmented fiendishness. His love for the Raja was changed to hate, and in his mad anger, he flung discretion to the winds. Driven once to frenzy by the Raja's scornful treatment, he sprang upon the Raja with a knife, but fortunately was seized and disarmed. To his unspeakable dismay, the Raja sentenced him for this offense, to suffer amputation of the remaining arm. It was done as in the former instance. This had the effect of putting a temporary curb on Naranya's spirit, or rather of changing the outward manifestations of his diabolism. Being armless, he was at first largely at the mercy of those who ministered to his needs, a duty which I undertook to see was properly discharged, for I felt an interest in this strangely distorted nature. His sense of helplessness, combined with a damnable scheme for revenge, which he had secretly formed, caused Naranya to change his fierce, impetuous, and unruly conduct into a smooth, quiet, insinuating bearing, which he carried so artfully as to deceive those with whom he was brought in contact, including the Raja himself. Naranya, being exceedingly quick, intelligent, and dexterous, and having an unconquerable will, turned his attention to the cultivating of an enlarged usefulness of his legs, feet, and toes, with so excellent effect that in time he was able to perform wonderful feats with those members. Thus his capability especially for destructive mischief, was considerably restored. One morning the Raja's only son, a young man of an uncommonly amiable and noble disposition, was found dead in bed. His murder was a most atrocious one, his body being mutilated in a shocking manner. But in my eyes, the most significant of all the mutilations was the entire removal and disappearance of the young prince's arms. The death of the young man nearly brought the Raja to the grave. It was not, therefore, until I had nursed him back to health that I began a systematic inquiry into the murder. I said nothing of my own discoveries and conclusions until after the Raja and his officers had failed and my work had been done. Then I submitted to him a written report, making a close analysis of all the circumstances 
and closing by charging the crime to Naranya. The Raja, convinced by my proof and argument, at once ordered Naranya to be put to death, this to be accomplished slowly and with frightful tortures. The sentence was so cruel and revolting that it filled me with horror, and I implored that the wretch be shot. Finally, through a sense of gratitude to me, the Raja relaxed. When Naranya was charged with a crime, he denied it, of course, but seeing that the Raja was convinced, he threw aside all restraint, and dancing, laughing, and shrieking in the most horrible manner, confessed his guilt, gloated over it, and reviled the Raja to his teeth, this knowing that some fearful death awaited him. The Raja decided upon the details of the matter that night, and in the morning informed me of his decision. It was that Naranya's life should be spared, but that both of his legs should be broken with hammers, and that then I should amputate the limbs at the trunk. Appended to this horrible sentence was a provision that the maimed wretch should be kept and tortured at regular intervals by such means as afterward might be devised. Sickened to the heart by the awful duty set out for me, I nevertheless performed it with success, and I cared to say that nothing more about that part of the tragedy. Naranya escaped death very narrowly and was a long time in recovering his wanted vitality. During all these weeks, the Raja neither saw him nor made inquiries concerning him. But when, as in duty bound, I made official report that the man had recovered his strength, the Raja's eyes brightened and he emerged with deadly activity from the stupor into which he so long had been plunged. The Raja's palace was a noble structure, but it is necessary here to describe only the Grand Hall. It was an immense chamber, with a floor of polished inlaid stone and a lofty arched ceiling. A soft light stole into it through stained glass set in the roof, and in high windows on one side. In the middle of the room was a rich fountain, which threw up a tall slender column of water, with smaller and shorter jets grouped around it. Across one end of the hall, halfway to the ceiling, was a balcony, which communicated with the upper story of a wing, and from which a flight of stone stairs descended to the floor of the hall. During the hot summers this room was delightfully cool. It was Daraja's favorite lounging place, and when the nights were hot he had his cot taken thither, and there he slept. This hall was chosen for Naranya's permanent prison. Here was he to stay so long as he might live, with never a glimpse of the shining world or the glorious heavens. To one of his nervous, discontented nature, such confinement was worse than death. At the Raja's orders, there was constructed for him a small pen of open ironwork, circular and about four feet in diameter, elevated on four slender iron posts, ten feet above the floor, and placed between the balcony and the fountain. Such was Naranya's prison. The pen was about four feet in depth, and the pen top was left open for the convenience of the servants, whose duty it would be to care for him. These precautions for his safe confinement were taken at my suggestion for although the man was now deprived of all four of his limbs, I still feared that he might develop some extraordinary, unheard of power for mischief. It was provided that the attendant should reach his cage by means of a movable ladder. All these arrangements having been made, and Naranya hosted into his cage, the Raja emerged upon the balcony to see him for the first time since the last amputation. Naranya had been lying panting and helpless on the floor of his cage, but when his quick ear caught the sound of the Raja's footfall, he squirmed about until he had brought the back of his head against the railing, elevating his eyes above his chest and enabling him to peer through the open work of the cage. Thus the two deadly enemies faced each other. The Raja's stern face paled at sight of the hideous, shapeless thing which met his gaze, but he soon recovered, and the old, hard, cruel, sinister look returned. Naranya's black hair and beard had grown long 
and they added to the natural ferocity of his aspect. His eyes blazed upon the Raja with a terrible light. His lips parted and he gasped for breath. His face was ashen with rage and despair, and his thin, distended nostrils quivered. The Raja folded his arms and gazed down from the balcony upon the frightful wreck that he had made. Oh, the dreadful pathos of that picture, the inhumanity of it, the deep and dismal tragedy of it. Who might look into the wild, despairing heart of the prisoner and see and understand the frightful turmoil there, the surging, choking passion, unbridled but impotent ferocity, frantic thirst for a vengeance that should be deeper than hell. Naranya gazed, his shapeless body heaving, his eyes aflame, and then in a strong, clear voice which rang throughout the great hall. With rapid speech, he hurled at the Raja the most insulting defiance, the most awful curses. He cursed the womb that had conceived him, the food that should nourish him, the wealth that had brought him power, cursed him in the name of Buddha and all the wise men, cursed by the sun, the moon, and the stars, by the continents, mountains, oceans, and rivers, by all things living, cursed his head, his heart, his entrails, cursed in a whirlwind of unmentionable words, heaped unimaginable insults and continuously upon him, called him a knave, a beast, a fool, a liar, an infamous and unspeakable coward. The Raja heard it all calmly, without the movement of a muscle, without the slightest change of countenance. And when the poor wretch had exhausted his strength and fallen helpless and silent to the floor, the Raja with a crim cold smile turned and strode away. The days passed, the Raja, not deterred by Naranya's curses, often heaped upon him, spent even more time than formerly in the great hall, and slept there oftener at night, and finally Naranya, wearied of cursing and defying him, and fell into a sullen silence. The man was a study for me, and I observed every change in his fleeting moods. Generally his condition was that of miserable despair, which he attempted bravely to conceal. Even the boon of suicide had been denied him, for when he would wiggle into an erect position, the rail of his pen was a foot above his head, so that he could not clamber over and break his skull on the stone floor beneath, and when he had tried to starve himself, the attendants forced food down his throat, so that he abandoned such attempts. At times his eyes would blaze and his breath would come in gasps, for imaginary vengeance was working within him. But steadily he became quieter and more tractable, and was pleasant and responsive when I would converse with him. Whatever might have been the tortures which the Raja had decided on, none as yet had been ordered. And although Naranya knew that they were in contemplation, he never referred to them or complained of his lot. The awful climax of the situation was reached one night, and even after this lapse of years, I cannot approach his description without a shudder. It was a hot night, and the Raja had gone to sleep in the great hall, lying on a high cot placed on the main floor just underneath the edge of the balcony. I had been unable to sleep in my own apartment, and so I had stolen into the great hall through the heavily curtained entrance at the end furthest from the balcony. As I entered, I heard a peculiar soft sound above the patter of the fountain. Naranya's cage was partly concealed from my view by the spraying water, but I suspected that the unusual sound came from him. Stealing a little to one side and crouching against the dark hanging of the wall, I could see him in the faint light which dimly illuminated the hall. And then I discovered that my surmise was correct. Naranya was quietly at work, curious to learn more knowing that only mischief could have been inspiring him. I sank into a thick robe on the floor and watched him. To my great astonishment, Naranya was tearing off with his teeth the bag which served as his outer garment. He did it cautiously, casting sharp glances frequently at the Raja, who, sleeping soundly on the cot below, breathed heavily. After starting a strip with his teeth, 
Naranya by the same means would attach it to the railing of his cage, and then wiggle away, much after the manner of a caterpillar's crawling, and this would cause the strip to be torn out the full length of his garment. He repeated this operation with incredible patience and skill until his entire garment had been torn into strips. Two or three of these he tied end to end with his teeth, lips, and tongue, tightening the knots by placing one end of the strip under his body and drawing the other taut with his teeth. In this way he made a line several feet long, one end of which he made fast to the rail with his mouth. It then began to dawn upon me that he was going to make an insane attempt, impossible of achievement without hands, feet, arms, or legs, to escape from his cage. For what purpose? The Raja was asleep in the hall. Ah, oh, I caught my breath. Oh, the desperate, insane thirst for revenge, which could have been hinged so clear and firm a mind. Even though he should accomplish the impossible feat of climbing over the railing of his cage, that he might fall to the floor below, for how could he slide down the rope? He would be in all probability killed or stunned, and even if he should escape these dangers, it would be impossible for him to clamber upon the cot without rousing the Raja, and impossible even though the Raja were dead. Amazed at the man's daring, and convinced that his sufferings and brooding had destroyed his reason, nevertheless I watched him with breathless interest. With other strips tied together, he made a short swing across one side of his cage. He caught the long line in his teeth at a point not far from the rail, then wiggling with great effort to an upright position. His back braced against the rail, he put his chin over the swing and worked toward one end. He tightened the grasp of his chin on the swing and with tremendous exertion, working the lower end of his spine against the railing, he began gradually to ascend the side of his cage. The labor was so great that he was compelled to pause at intervals, and his breathing was hard and painful. And even while thus resting he was in a position of terrible strain, and his pushing against the swing caused it to press hard against his windpipe and nearly strangle him. After amazing effort, he had elevated the lower end of his body until it protruded above the railing, the top of which was now across the lower end of his abdomen. Gradually he worked his body over, going backwards, until there was sufficient excess of weight on the outer side of the rail, and then, with a quick lurch, he raised his head and shoulders and swung into a horizontal position on top of the rail. Of course, he would have fallen to the floor below, had it not been for the line which he held in his teeth. With so great nicety had he estimated the distance between his mouth and the point where the rope was fastened to the rail and the line tightened and checked him, just as he reached the horizontal position on the rail. If one had told me beforehand that such a feat as I had just seen this man accomplish was possible, I should have thought him a fool. Naranya was now balanced on his stomach across the top of the rail, and he eased his position by bending his spine and hanging down on either side as much as possible. Having rested thus for some minutes, he began cautiously to slide off backward, slowly paying out the line through his teeth, finding almost a fatal difficulty in passing the knots. Now it is quite possible that the line would have escaped altogether from his teeth laterally, when he would slightly relax his hold to let it slip, had it not been for a very ingenious plan to which he had resorted. This consisted in his having made a turn of the line around his neck before he attacked the wing, thus securing a threefold control of the line, one by his teeth, another by friction against his neck, and a third by his ability to compress it between his cheek and shoulder. It was quite evident now that the minutest detail of a most elaborate plan had been carefully worked out by him before beginning the task and that possibly weeks of difficult theoretical study had been consumed in the mental preparation. As I observed him, I was reminded of certain hitherto unaccountable things which he had been doing for some weeks past, going through certain hitherto inexplicable motions, undoubtedly for the purpose of training his muscles for the immeasurably arduous labor 
which he was now performing. A stupendous and seemingly impossible part of his task had been accomplished. Could he reach the floor in safety? Gradually he worked himself backward over the rail, in imminent danger of falling, but his nerve never wavered, and I could see a wonderful light in his eyes. With something of a lurch, his body fell against the outer side of the railing, to which he was hanging by his chin. The line still held firmly in his teeth. Slowly he slipped his chin from the rail, and then hung suspended by the line in his teeth. By almost imperceptible degrees, with infinite caution, he descended the line, and finally his unwieldy body rolled upon the floor, safe and unhurt. What miracle would this superhuman monster next accomplish? I was quick and strong, and was ready and able to intercept any dangerous act. But not until danger appeared would I interfere with this extraordinary scene. I must confess to astonishment upon having observed that Naranya, instead of proceeding directly toward the sleeping Raja, took quite another direction. Then it was only escape, after all, that the wretch contemplated, and not the murder of the Raja. But how could he escape? The only possible way to reach the outer air without great risk was by ascending the stairs to the balcony, and leaving by the corridor which opened upon it, and thus fall into the hands of some British soldiers quartered thereabout, who might conceive the idea of hiding him. But surely it was impossible for Naranya to ascend that long flight of stairs. Nevertheless, he made directly for them. His method of progression this. He lay upon his back, with the lower end of his body towards the stair, then bowed his spine upward, thus drawing his head and shoulders a little forward, straightened, and then pushed the lower end of his body forward a space equal to that through which he had drawn his head. Repeating this again and again each time while bending his spine, preventing his head from slipping by pressing it against the floor. His progress was laborious and slow, but sensible, and finally arrived at the foot of the stairs. It was manifest that his insane purpose was to ascend them. The desire for freedom must have been strong within him. Wiggling to an upright position against the kneel post, he looked up at the great height which he had to climb and sighed but there was no dimming of the light in his eyes. How could he accomplish the impossible task? His solution of the problem was very simple, though daring and perilous as all the rest. While leaning against the kneel post, he let himself fall diagonally upon the bottom steps, where he lay partly hanging over, but safe on his side. Turning upon his back, he wiggled forward along the step to the rail and raised himself to an upright position against it, as he had again the kneel post, fell as before and landed on the second step. In this manner, with inconceivable labor, he accomplished the ascent of the entire flight of stairs. It being apparent to me that the Raja was not the object of Naranya's movements, the anxiety which I had felt on that account was now entirely dissipated. The things which already had accomplished were entirely beyond the nimblest imagination. The sympathy which I had always felt for the wretched man was now greatly quickened, and as infinitesimally small as I knew his chances for escape to be, I nevertheless hoped that he would succeed. Any assistance from me, however, was out of the question, and it should never be known that I had witnessed the escape. Naranya was now upon the balcony, and I could dimly see him wiggling along toward the door, which led out upon the balcony. Finally he stopped and wiggled to an upright position against the rail which had wide openings between the bolsters. His back was toward me, but he slowly turned and faced me and the hall. At that great distance I could not distinguish his features, but the slowness with which he had worked, even before he had fully accomplished the ascent of the stairs, was evidence all too eloquent of his extreme exhaustion. Nothing but a most desperate resolution could have sustained him thus far, but he had drawn upon the last remnant of his strength, he looked around the hall with a sweeping glance, and then down upon the Raja, who was sleeping immediately beneath him, over twenty feet below. He looked long and earnestly, sinking lower and lower and lower upon the rail. Suddenly, to my inconceivable astonishment and dismay, 
he toppled through and shot downward from his lofty height. I held my breath expecting to see him crushed upon the stone floor beneath, but instead of that he fell full upon the Raja's breast. Driving him through the cot to the floor, I sprang forward with a loud cry for help and was instantly at the scene of the catastrophic. With indescribable horror, I saw that Naranya's teeth were buried in the Raja's throat. I tore the wretch away, but the blood was pouring from the Raja's arteries. His chest was crushed in, and he was gasping in the agony of death. People came running in, terrified. I turned to Naranya. He lay upon his back, his face hideously smeared with blood. Murder and not escape had been his intention from the beginning, and he had employed the only method by which there was ever a possibility of accomplishing it. I knelt beside him and saw that he too was dying. His back had been broken by the fall. He smiled sweetly into my face, and a triumphant look of accomplished revenge sat upon his face, even in death. <laughs>